Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Lisa, and I'm here to share some words by Oswald Chambers. The first one is titled, The Delight of Despair. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Revelation 1, verse 17. It may be that, like the Apostle John, you know Jesus Christ intimately, yet when he suddenly appears to you with totally unfamiliar characteristics, the only thing you can do is fall at his feet as dead. There are times when God cannot reveal himself in any other way than in his majesty, and it is the awesomeness of the vision which brings you to the delight of despair. You experience this joy in hopelessness, realizing that if you are ever to be raised up, it must be by the hand of God. He laid his right hand on me. Revelation 1 verse 17 In the midst of the awesomeness, a touch comes, and you know it is the right hand of Jesus Christ. You know it is not the hand of restraint, correction, nor chastisement, but the right hand of the everlasting Father. Whenever his hand is laid upon you, it gives inexpressible peace and comfort and the sense that underneath are the everlasting arms. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. Full of support, provision, comfort, and strength. And once his touch comes, nothing at all can throw you into fear again. In the midst of all his ascended glory, the Lord Jesus comes to speak to an insignificant disciple, saying, Do not be afraid. Revelation 1 verse 17 His tenderness is inexpressibly sweet. Do I know him like that? Take a look at some of the things that cause despair. There is despair which has no delight, no limits whatsoever, and no hope of anything brighter. But the delight of despair comes when I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Romans 7 verse 18 I delight in knowing that there is something in me which must fall prostrate before God when he reveals himself to me, and also in knowing that if I am ever to be raised up, it must be by the hand of God. God can do nothing for me until I recognize the limits of what is humanly possible, allowing him to do the impossible. And that's the end of the first one. And the second one is titled, Our Careful Unbelief. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Matthew 6, verse 25. Jesus summed up common sense carefulness in the life of a disciple as unbelief. If we have received the Spirit of God, he will squeeze right through our lives, as if to ask, Now where do I come into this relationship, this vacation you have planned, or these new books you want to read? And he always presses the point until we learn to make him our first consideration. Whenever we put other things first, there is confusion. Do not worry about your life. Don't take the pressure of your provision upon yourself. It is not only wrong to worry, it is unbelief. Worrying means we do not believe that God can look after the practical details of our lives, and it is never anything but those details that worry us. Have you ever noticed what Jesus said would choke the word he puts in us? Is it the devil? No the cares of this world, Matthew 13, verse 22. It is always our little worries. We say, I will not trust when I cannot see, and that is where unbelief begins. The only cure for unbelief is obedience to the Spirit. The greatest word of Jesus to his disciples is abandon. And that's the end of the second one. And the last one I'd like to share with you all is titled, 
the explanation for our difficulties. That they may that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. John 17, verse 21. If you are going through a time of isolation, seemingly all alone, read John chapter 17. It will explain exactly why you are where you are, because Jesus has prayed that you may be one with the Father as He is. Are you helping God to answer that prayer, or do you have some other goal for your life? Since you became a disciple, you cannot be as independent as you used to be. God reveals in John 17 that His purpose is not just to answer our prayers, but that through prayer we might come to discern His mind. Yet there is one prayer which God must answer, and that is the prayer of Jesus, that they may be one, just as we are one. John 17, verse 22. Are we as close to Jesus Christ as that? God is not concerned about our plans. He doesn't ask, Do you want to go through this loss of a loved one, this difficulty, or this defeat? No, he allows these things for his own purpose. The things we are going through are either making us sweeter, better, and nobler men and women, or they are making us more critical and fault-finding and more insistent on our own way. The things that happen either make us evil or they make us more saintly, depending entirely on on our relationship with God and its level of intimacy. If we will pray regarding our own lives, your will be done, in Matthew 26, verse 42, then we will be encouraged and comforted by John chapter 17, knowing that our Father is working according to his own wisdom, accomplishing what is best. When we understand God's purpose, we will not become small-minded and cynical. Jesus prayed nothing less for us than absolute oneness with himself, just as he was one with the Father. Some of us are far from this oneness, yet God will not leave us alone until we are one with him, because Jesus prayed that they all may be one. And that is the end of these words. I pray you all have a beautiful day in the Lord. God bless each and every one of you. And if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please call on him right now. Ask him into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. And from then on, have a relationship with him. You all have a great day, and I will see you either next video or in the air. Bye-bye.